difficulties and hardships, there are trials. And yet, we must realize that it's through the testing of our faith that God is purifying us. And there is a purpose for these things. There is an eternal purpose. And Peter speaks here, of course, he's writing to the first century Christians, but uh, things are relatively the same from age to age. He's speaking about them having been grieved by various trials. Let me read to you a couple of portions of the New Testament that will give uh, a better idea, a more specific uh, picture of some of the trials that they were experiencing. Paul, in writing here, speaking of himself and his companions in ministry, he said, we patiently endure suffering and hardship and trouble of every kind. We have been beaten, put in jail, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, stayed awake through sleepless nights of watching, and gone without food. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. These bodies of ours are constantly facing death just as Jesus did. So this is Paul's uh, description of some of the things that he was going through. Now, of course, Paul was an apostle and he was uh, actively spreading the gospel. And so he had this kind of opposition, but it was a similar type of experience for just the average Christian. Listen to what was written to the Hebrew Christians. Don't ever forget those wonderful days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you kept right on with the Lord even though it meant terrible sufferings? Sometimes you were laughed at and beaten. And sometimes you watched and sympathized with others suffering the same things. You suffered with those thrown into jail. And you were actually joyful when all you owned was taken from you, knowing that better things were awaiting you in heaven, things that would be yours for eternity. So here we have two uh, pretty vivid descriptions of the kind of trials, the kind of suffering that the early Christians faced. One uh, historian said this regarding the early Christians. He said, to suffer as a Christian meant the loss of business, reputation, and home, desertion by parents, children, and friends, misrepresentation, hatred, and even death. The new convert became the target for every weapon hurled from any quarter. Trials are the same from age to age. And the kinds of things that we read about here now, of course, many of these things seem quite extreme to us. We haven't um, been put in jail because of our faith. We haven't been beaten. We haven't, uh, we don't really necessarily know anyone who's been uh, put to death for their faith in Christ. But these kinds of things are happening in various parts of the world even to this very day. And even if we're not experiencing those extreme kinds of manifestations, of course, we all go through our own struggles. We all go through trials, and perhaps you are in the midst of a trial here today. Maybe it has to do with your health. Maybe it has to do with the financial uh, crisis that the country and the world is in. Uh, maybe it is something to do with your family. Uh, maybe you are actually being persecuted uh, because of your faith. If you're experiencing a trial today, these are the things that you need to remember. Number one, know this, trials are temporary. They're temporary. It's not permanent. 
it will pass after this season. As, as Peter tells us here, it's, it's uh, for a little while, and notice he also says, if need be. Now, if you asked me if I ever needed trials, I would say no. <laughs> I, I don't need trials. I don't think, anyway. But, but God knows better than we do. And Peter tells us, if need be, these things will transpire, but it will be for a season, for a little while. Let me give you a couple of other verses that remind us of that. In writing to the Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 13th verse, uh, Paul says there, uh, no temptation has overtaken you. Uh, the word temptation can also be translated testing or trial. And so we can read it that way. No testing or trial has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted or tried beyond what you are able, but with the testing will also make a way of escape. Or another translation, another uh, legitimate translation, is that he will bring it to an end. So we're told here that, that trials are not the permanent experience. They, they are seasonal. Paul speaks of our light affliction in writing to the Corinthians in the second epistle. He refers to it as something that is but for a moment. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. And then Peter later on will say, may the God of all grace, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So thank God trials are not uh, the, the permanent experience of the Christian. Uh, God in his mercy, he, he allows them to come, but he knows when to uh, bring us uh, out of that. And in doing so, he perfects us, he establishes us, he strengthens us, and he settles us. So we need to remember that, that trials are temporary. Secondly, we need to know that trials are necessary for, number one, perfecting our faith. You see, a trial is not for nothing. God uses these things to perfect our faith. Now, Peter, uh, he argues from the less to the greater. He, of course, speaks of gold being refined or purified or tried. And so what he's saying essentially is this, if we think so much of gold and corruptible metal that we prove it by fire so that it may acquire its real value, what wonder is it that God should require a similar trial of our faith since faith has such excellence in his eyes? You know, it does seem that faith is the greatest um, thing that we can offer to God. Faith is of the greatest value in the sight of God. One writer said this, and I, I think he's right. He said, our limitless trust in God seems to satisfy him as nothing else can do because it corresponds with his eternal faithfulness. It honors his veracity, and it is a constant silent worship of all his perfections. Faith, trust, believing in the Lord through these things. Now, uh, of course, I'm, I'm helped to do that if I realize that God is doing something through these things. If I realize that, that he's purifying my, my faith, that he's, he's bringing... Um, all out of it that, that is possible so that it might be found to praise and to honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So my, my faith might be all that God desires it to be. He allows me to go through things that force me to trust him. That, that's really what a trial is. A trial is an opportunity to trust God. It is, uh, that, that's the, the primary purpose of it, to, to enable us to, you know, trust the Lord. We, we talk about trusting the Lord, 
You know, we say we trust God, but do we really trust him? Well, it becomes clear whether we really trust him or not when things don't go the way we thought they would go. Now, when everything is going well, you know, it's relatively easy to trust God when things are going well, isn't it? But it's amazing how, you know, someone who can have such great confidence in the Lord normally, uh, once something goes wrong, all of a sudden they're, they're ready to throw in the towel. They're ready to give it up. Oh, I can't believe God is allowing me to go through this. But you see, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to trust the Lord and to see your faith develop. So trials are necessary for the perfecting of our faith. Secondly, trials are necessary for the strengthening of the faith of other believers. You see, the things that we go through, God allows us to go through them not only to perfect our own faith, but to help in the perfecting of the faith of others. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and he referred to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. And, and Paul saw that his imprisonment, now that is a trial. That would be an extremely challenging kind of a situation. Can you imagine being put in prison for the gospel? Paul had not done anything wrong uh, except he'd preached the gospel. And for this, he was in prison. And he could have looked at it as God had uh, forgotten about him. He could have, um, you know, thought about it in terms of, uh, you know, Nero's the one who has uh, perpetrated this on me. But Paul saw himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He could see behind everything else God was sovereignly at work. And Paul understood that to some degree, this imprisonment was to benefit other believers. It was to benefit the Gentiles. One of the great benefits that we've received even today from the imprisonment of Paul are many of the letters that he wrote. You know, Paul was an extremely busy and active person. I wonder, had he not been in prison, if we would have a New Testament like we have today. Five of the epistles were written by Paul while he was in prison. Paul also said that his chains emboldened others to preach without fear. People were uh, timid. They were a bit afraid to speak up uh, about their faith in Christ. But when Paul was arrested and put in prison, they figured, well, if Paul can go to prison for the gospel, we can surely talk about Jesus to other people. And so you see, he saw that his own trials and afflictions were partially to strengthen and uh, encourage others. John and Betty Stam, who were martyred in China by the communist, sparked a, their, their martyrdom sparked a missionary fire in 700 college students. So when news of their martyrdom hit, hit uh, back here in the United States. 700 uh, young people committed themselves to service to the Lord. Nate Saint and Jim Elliott's martyrate, uh, martyrdom produced a similar response. You see, you never know who's watching. And whether it be a health crisis, a family crisis, a financial crisis, when you handle those things in faith, you can be a tremendous encouragement to others. They can look on and say, well, you know, if, if they can retain their peace and their joy while they're going through that, well, my situation isn't nearly as desperate as theirs. I can trust the Lord as well. And so you see, the Lord uses trials not only to perfect our faith, but also to help us in the perfecting of the, face, uh, of the faith of others. Now, thirdly, we have to remember this. Our faith will be rewarded. And Peter tells us there in that uh, ninth verse, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. 
Now, ultimately, as he's already told us, we have an, an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled. Uh, it, it's not going to fade away. It's reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through faith. And it's in this that we greatly rejoice, even though if for a season we're going through the, these challenging times. But ultimately, ultimately, our faith will be rewarded. Now, sometimes our faith is rewarded in the here and now. I, I think many times our faith is rewarded in the here and now. The, the Bible has many promises of salvation or deliverance found in many places in Scripture, but especially in the Psalms. You know, whenever we read the word salvation, we tend to think of it in, in the sense of uh, salvation eternally. We tend, we tend to think of it as heaven, and which, of course, much of the time, uh, most of the time, that is what it's referring to, and, and to some extent, all the time. But we have to also realize that salvation speaks of immediate salvation or deliverance from present suffering, deliverance from present trials, and then the, the promises of God being fulfilled toward us. Let me read to you a few psalms real quickly. Psalm 30, I, extol, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. And now listen. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. And you have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. You see, the, the, um, the psalmist is expressing his faith, his dependency on God, and then God's faithfulness to reward that faith. Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all of his troubles. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. And now listen, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. That's life. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We sometimes get to thinking that, well, you know, if we're really good Christians, we'll never have any trouble. We'll never go through difficulty. We'll never have any hardship or challenges. No, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the good news is this. The Lord delivers him out of them all. And then one more, Psalm 66. Oh, bless our God, you peoples. And make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. We went through fire and through flood, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. I love that verse. We've gone through fire. We've gone through floods. We've gone through storms. We've gone through difficult, difficult things. But what is the outcome? You brought us out to rich fulfillment. You see, our faith will be rewarded. God is not allowing this for naught. He's purifying our faith. He's perfecting our faith. And, and our faith, even in this life, very often, we will see reward. We might not totally understand things in this life. Some things might be left for the life to come. But for the most part, even in this life, we experience that reward of our faith. But there are those rare occasions uh, when in the present age, faith does not always receive an outward or an evident reward. Henry Morrison had served God faithfully for 40 years as a missionary in Africa, and he was returning, finally, home permanently. He was sailing home on a ship, 
And Theodore Roosevelt happened to be on that same ship with him, uh, coming home from a hunting, uh, a safari, a hunting expedition in Africa. And when the ship came into New, uh, New York Harbor, the multitudes were there, the throngs of people cheering the returning president. And Henry Morrison, in his heart, he was saddened, for there was no cheering throng to greet him. And as he thought about it, and as he began to sink into a bit of depression, that still small voice spoke to his heart and said, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. But there's coming a day when we will have an abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's purposes in present grief may not be fully known in a week, in a year, or even in this lifetime. Indeed, some of God's purposes will only be discovered at the day of final judgment when the Lord reveals the secrets of all hearts and commends with special honor those who trusted him in hardship, even though they could not see the reason for it. They trusted him simply because he was their God and they knew him to be worthy of trust. It is in times when the reason for hardship cannot be seen that trust in God alone seems to become most pure and precious in his sight. Such faith he will not forget, but will store up as a jewel of great value and beauty to be displayed and delighted in on the day of judgment. You know, sometimes we go through things that we just will never figure out. And it's when we trust God even then that's when faith will be purified most thoroughly. Are you being grieved today by various trials? Perhaps you're suffering physically. Maybe you're battling an illness, a chronic condition. Maybe you live with constant pain. Or maybe financially you're suffering in this economy. Maybe you've lost your savings, maybe you've lost your job, you're going through a financial difficulty, maybe emotionally you're suffering because you've been hurt, you've been betrayed, maybe uh, you're in the midst of a family crisis, maybe you're suffering spiritually, maybe you are being persecuted and ostracized specifically because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And you know, when these kinds of things happen to us, the enemy is right there. He, he's always looking for that moment of uh, weakness or vulnerability. He's always looking for that opportunity to, to rush in and to try to, um, well, not just discourage us, but to try to get us to, to give up. Oh, what's the use of following Jesus? Look, you know, ever since you've become a Christian, all these troubles have come your way. He'll come along and say things like that. And, and I have seen, and seemingly far too frequently in these days, I've seen people as they, as they are going into times of difficulty, instead of clinging to the Lord, which is the very thing we should be doing, uh, withdrawing from the Lord. We don't want to do that. We've got to remember that God is at work. These are the tools. These are the very things that God uses to perfect and to purify our faith so that when we finally arrive in heaven, and that's what we have to keep. It's the eternal perspective. We, we tend to think of things all, only in the here and now. How does this affect me today? How will this affect me tomorrow? What about five years, 10 years from now? We need to think beyond that. What about eternity? You see, God is working many things in our lives that are actually preparing us for eternity. He's preparing us for forever. And we've got to keep that in mind. And so this is the word, don't give up. As we sang this morning, don't give up. God is on our side. And these trials only serve to produce for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory.
Understand it. Understand your pain. Understand your suffering. Understand your hardship, your difficulty in that light. And that will enable you to be, as Peter says here, um, filled with joy unspeakable because the Lord is at work. Your circumstances might be, uh, to some extent, unbearable. But yet, on the other hand, God is working out something beautiful. Let me close with one more word from the psalmist. Psalm 27. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Listen, this is the psalmist. You think you're the only one going through a trial? Everybody goes through them, even the psalmist, even the biblical writer. And what did the psalmist say? I would have lost heart. Oh, things were so overwhelming. Things were so difficult. Things were, were so challenging. I almost fainted. I would have lost heart unless, unless I had believed. Faith, keep trusting God, keep depending on him, keep waiting on him as it says here, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, he shall strengthen your heart and he shall come through and bring a blessing in the end. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that these promises are absolutely certain. Lord, that your word is true. And Lord, that we have millions of testimonies to your faithfulness. And Lord, today, no doubt, there are some here that are in a season of affliction. Lord, thank you that it's just a season, that it will pass. And when it passes, as we continue to trust you, you're going to bring us through with our faith having been refined and further purified and being made ready for your coming. So Lord, help us not to lose heart. Help us to believe your word. Help us to keep standing on it. Help us, Lord, not to give up, but to keep trusting you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together if you need some personal prayer or maybe some uh, individual encouragement today with the difficulty you might be uh, facing. The pastors are here up front available to you and would love to uh, be here to pray with you. And may God bless you and may he strengthen you. And let's just remind ourselves once again as we just sing that chorus one more time, just singing it to each other, singing it to ourselves not to give up because God is on our side. God bless you. Don't give up for God is on our side. Don't give up running for the prize. Don't Strength to fight, there's grace in that for you. Don't give up, don't give up. For God is on our side, don't give up. Running for the prize, don't give up. No, to give you strength to fight. God bless you. Have a great day.
where the Lord is for you. 